Funding for NJ Business Beat provided by NJCU School of Business, a game-changing force offering programs like financial technology or business analytics and data science. We're steps away from the Exchange Place Path Train in Jersey City and minutes from Wall Street. Learn more at njcu.edu slash gamechanger. This week on NJ Business Beat, billions for our roads, bridges, and more. How New Jersey's infrastructure will improve with the passage of the president's trillion dollar bill. Plus, climate change in action. How New Jersey is represented at the massive climate conference overseas. And we're putting the business of sports in focus, including how New Jersey sports teams work behind the scenes, new financial opportunities for college athletes, and the big record-breaking boom for sports betting. That's straight ahead on NJ Business Beat. This is NJ Business Beat with Rhonda Schaffler. Hello, I'm Rhonda Schaffler. Thanks for joining us on NJ Business Beat. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe to our NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel to get alerted when we post new episodes and clips. Crumbling bridges, banged up roads, and a mass transit system in need of some upgrades. This is transportation in New Jersey. But now there's a lot of money coming our way to fix those things. The state will receive more than $12 billion now that Congress has passed a $1 trillion infrastructure bill. President Biden will sign the bill on November 15th. It also includes billions of dollars in funding for the long-awaited Hudson River Tunnel Project, which is part of the Gateway Program. The New Jersey Chamber of Commerce said the investment will create thousands of good-paying jobs and called infrastructure the foundation of New Jersey's economy. Transit advocates and Governor Murphy are eager to get those projects started. It was an unprecedented investment in Amtrak's Northeast Corridor uh, that, that was included in the infrastructure bill. So we should see improvements you know, from Trenton up, up to New York City um, and much smoother uh, rides over Amtrak property, including all the elements of the Gateway Program uh, and the Hudson Tunnel Project. On top of money from the infrastructure bill, NJ Transit is also getting nearly $2.7 billion in federal pandemic relief funds. That after the governors of New Jersey, New York, and Connecticut reached an agreement on how to divide up $14 billion in COVID-19 transit aid following months of negotiations, NJ Transit was expecting to get an estimated $3.6 billion. Federal money will allow the transit agencies to cover revenue losses that occurred from ridership declines. Business leaders joined government officials and advocates this past week at the UN Climate Summit, known as COP26. The goal of the summit, reduce global warming by cutting carbon emissions. One New Jersey executive was part of the conversation Ralph Izzo, the CEO of Public Service Enterprise Group, a funder of NJPBS. He was one of just a handful of utility CEOs attending the conference in Glasgow, Scotland. Ralph, how does a New Jersey utility executive like yourself find his way to COP26? What made you want to attend the conference? Well, our industry is prominent in climate change related issues for many decades the electric power industry was the number one emitter of carbon in the United States. It's now number two behind transportation. And New Jersey being as active as we are on environmental issues, our companies played a prominent role among industry members uh, in terms of what to do to have less of an environmental impact as we provide this essential service to people. So my right. colleagues asked if I was interested in, in coming to COP26 as it was going to be sort of the 50 year refresh of the Paris Accord. So I was happy to come and do that. You've actually participated in several panels. Um, what have you learned that you can bring back to New Jersey? In the past, COP was about government negotiations. There are 50,000 people here by some estimates. Only a thousand of them are involved in negotiations. The implications of that are that businesses and not-for-profit organizations and other interested citizens aren't waiting for government. This planet is in trouble. 
The direction we need to go in is clear. The pace varies depending upon where you're from, but there's no question as to the direction. And businesses like PSCG, who've said we're going to get to net zero by 2030, are taking matters into their own hands. Having said that, the role of government is essential in facilitating the accelerated movement in the right direction. Here in New Jersey, can the goal of reaching net zero by 2030 be achieved, do you think? And, and what does PSCG have to do to get there at this point? Getting to net zero means that we'll have to repair some of our gas pipes that leak methane, which we are well underway doing. It means that we will have to reduce the emissions from our power plants. And we, as you know, we've closed all of our coal plants. A few years ago, we closed our most inefficient gas plants. And we recently sold our gas plants. Now that's, that's a little bit uh, of, uh, of an unfair characterization because that will make us look better but that won't really affect the planet because those plants will continue to operate. The one thing we won't be able to affect is the fact that every power line has a certain amount of loss. It's a law of physics. I won't bore you with the details. So as long as the grid is being supplied by fossil fuels, which it will be because we're part of a, of a regional grid, then those losses will be emission problems, so to speak. And what we'll need to do to offset those is buy emission credits from other organizations. We're gonna to have to really emphasize the use of energy efficiency to keep to a minimum how much natural gas people use in their home heating, in their industrial processes. And finally, let me ask you what role the wind energy industry off the coast of New Jersey is going to play. I know that's something that you're also involved in, in terms of thinking about getting the power that's generated offshore to homes in New Jersey. So New Jersey, as well as other mid-Atlantic and North New England states are really wise to uh, begin the investments in offshore wind so that we can bring down the cost of offshore wind by developing the supply chain. And the supply chain are things like the port wind facility that we're building in Salem County. Things of that nature will help make the second and third projects in offshore wind that much less expensive. Ralph, it's been a pleasure speaking with you from the conference. Thank you so much. It's great to see you, Ron. I look forward to seeing you again in the future. Take care. This week, the nation paused to honor our military veterans and their service to our country. For many, life after they leave the military includes trying to navigate your way through the business world. New Jersey has hundreds of businesses owned by veterans and they face unique challenges. I spoke with Colonel Jeff Cantor, CEO of the New Jersey State Veterans Chamber of Commerce, about the kind of support veteran-owned businesses need right now. How would you describe the state of veteran-owned businesses in New Jersey right now, uh, post-COVID, and as we're still trying to work our way into a healthier economy? So, so many veteran businesses, and when I say veteran businesses, I'm talking about veteran businesses, disabled veteran businesses, military spouse-owned businesses, have really uh, uh, just had a lot of difficult difficulty in navigating through the COVID pandemic. Uh, some of whom have shut their doors, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, and many of whom are struggling uh, because they can't get state contracts, uh, even though there's a 3% set aside in the state of New Jersey uh, that is public law, uh, the state currently is not really enforcing it that well. Uh, well, that certainly doesn't sound proper. Uh, what can be done about that? So we've had numerous conversations with uh, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. We've had discussions with the governor's office. Uh, we uh, recently rolled out a training program to all 72 state agencies with procurement uh, power to try to educate them on you know, what this law is. And essentially what it says is 3% of all state contracts are to be set aside for disabled veteran-owned businesses. And uh, unfortunately, like uh, I can't even begin to tell you, maybe the state is at about a $2 million spend with disabled veteran-owned businesses when they should be at uh, uh, several hundred million dollars spend uh, based upon the total number of contracts. There has been some efforts over this whole period when COVID hit to set aside some grant money specifically for veteran-owned businesses. 
have those programs been able to help? So some of them have, um, and I will say uh, New Jersey Economic Development Authority has been absolutely fantastic in helping uh, the veterans community in get, getting access to some of these grants and loans, the EIDL loans, the, uh, you know, the CARES Act funding, which they were a lifeline to many, many uh, organizations and many businesses that were suffering so badly during the pandemic. Well, how are the needs of veteran-owned business owners different than other business owners? Veteran businesses have a much harder uh, time gaining access to capital. And the Federal Reserve Bank actually published a study in 2018 to show that uh, veteran businesses just don't have the access to capital that the non-veteran counterparts do. And if you think about it, when veterans were out serving, when they were deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan and all these places, um, they were there serving their country when non-veterans were here building their business and helping to build networks and uh, just meet people to help them grow their business. Despite some of these obstacles we've talked about, do you still see a lot of interest among those who serve the country in terms of setting up their own business? A study was done um, that showed that the amount of veterans that are starting their own businesses has declined rapidly uh, since World War II. Um, it's only about 4% of veterans that start their own business. Uh, my thinking is that that's going to increase because there are fewer and fewer jobs coming about due to technology. Um, and so there's going to be a need for, for more veterans to start their own business or maybe go into a franchise. The governor and the, legislator, the legislature here in New Jersey really need to think through how to best support the veterans business community. And I know this is Veterans Day and it's, you know, it's one of the times that people think uh, about veterans, but we need to be able to compete in the open bid process. We need the help to gaining access to capital. We need the help in gaining access to markets and networks. And, you know, we don't normally have that. Well, thank you so much for giving us a state of what's going on with veteran-owned businesses in New Jersey. And of course, thank you as well for your service. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. With the weekend here, New Jersey sports fans are gearing up to watch their favorite teams. Between the NFL, NBA, and college sports, there's always something to watch. And your favorite teams are worth a lot of money. We decided to look at the dollars and cents behind the business of sports which we're putting in focus this week. Each year, Forbes puts together a report on the average value of NFL franchises. New Jersey's teams, yep, I said New Jersey, they do play at MetLife Stadium after all. The Giants and the Jets have a valuation that tops $4 billion. Other Jersey teams are worth a lot of money too, like the Devils, worth $530 million, and the Red Bull soccer team, which recently decided to build a new training center here in New Jersey, is valued at $505 million. Sports fans are back to attending games in person following COVID restrictions, and teams are hopeful that's going to be good for the bottom line. One New Jersey sports team weathered the pandemic and continues to see more and more fans returning. The Jersey Shore Blue Claws minor league baseball team is already gearing up for the spring season. We spoke with Joe Rachuti, the team's president and general manager. You know, it's been an interesting time for the Blue Claws. You got a new name in recent years and you've managed to continue to thrive even though we've had a tough period here in New Jersey. Yeah, uh, the Blue Claws are, um, we're a small business like so many other small businesses in the state. Uh, and needless to say, 2020, even 2021, were tremendously challenging. Um, but we, uh, we did thrive. We had, a, we had a really, really good season. Um, you know, it was not without its challenges, as, as we all felt. Um, but it was actually quite a, uh, quite a good season. I was really, really proud of, uh, of the efforts that our team did and just, you know, trying to get our gates open and welcome everybody safely back to the ballpark. What is it about minor league ball, do you think, that really captures the attention of people in New Jersey? And, and I know you've got to focus on getting families out to games. So what is the magic that goes on at a ballpark? Uh, minor league baseball is one of those last um, kind of bastions of, of entertainment that really does cut across uh, multi-generations. Um, you know, we'll see 
fans here who are, you know, kids with their grandparents and their parents. And, you know, it's, it's rare when you can go out and enjoy popular entertainment and really not have to worry about anything objectionable coming out over the PA system or uh, anything that, um, you know, wouldn't be appropriate for young kids, you know. So, yeah, have, it's very, very traditional kind of squeaky clean family entertainment. Um, and there's just something for everybody and for every generation here. So tell me what goes on behind the scenes. What are some of your challenges as president of the organization that you have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis? There are challenges that go along with welcoming 400 plus thousand people to a, a venue, um, making sure that it's clean, making sure that it's functional and operational, making sure that staff is trained, um, making sure that the entertainment is good, um, fireworks are good, you know, it's all the work that goes into um, providing those three hours worth of reprieve. Um, it's a year's worth of work and that literally begins before the prior season even ends. Are you rebounding from that tough season where you could not open the doors? Yeah, 2021 um, was definitely a rebound. It was far and away um, uh, better than we anticipated it was going to be. Um, it was wonderful to see fans particularly as we got to the midpoint of the season, um, have a comfort level getting together in mass again. That was great. Um, we were a little bit worried as to whether or not there was going to be still some, um, you know, some, some leftover um, sensitivities about being in larger crowds. And, um, and, and we were glad to see as we got into the season that, um, you know, three, four, 5,000 person crowds were, um, were back. Um, you know, even as, as good as that was compared to expectations, it was a fraction of what we would ordinarily see during the season. Um, 2022 looks tremendously promising. Um, we're seeing a lot of our groups coming back. Um, some you know, schools and camps and the traditional business groups and the folks that help um, make up a good portion of our audience um, were, um, were, were not coming out in, uh, in large part in 2021. Um, so it's nice to see that they've um, you know, kind of gotten back to normal again in 2022, and we'll be able to welcome all of them back. Joe, good luck in the next season. It's been great Thank talking to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And if you have a chance, please come on out and visit us. We'd love to welcome you to again. This has been a lucrative fall for some student athletes. Earlier this year, the NCAA adopted an interim name, image, and likeness policy, a policy that allows student athletes to make money through endorsements and sponsorships. All of this happened too late for one former New Jersey athlete, Brandon Wimbush, who played quarterback for Notre Dame. He didn't make it to the NFL, so he lost his opportunity to make money while playing football. But Wimbush is now helping other student athletes get paid through a company he co-founded with friend and CEO, Aiden Sayel. It's called Mogul. Aiden, Brandon, it's great to talk with both of you. Aiden, I wanna start with you. Tell me where the idea of this company came from. Yeah, Rhonda, thank you so much for the opportunity here. We're really excited to be here. Um, Mogul actually was designed in October of 2019 following legislation or protocols that California Governor Gavin Newsom put into effect that would allow California athletes to monetize their name, image, and likeness. We recognized that athletes don't have the time, the resources, or the access to seek out these opportunities to monetize their name, image, and likeness, and recognize that there would need to be a safe, secure, and compliant medium for them to do so. So we started getting to work in October of 2019. So Brandon, let me turn to you in terms of how the athletes found you or how you found the athletes and what you guys are doing for them. For me, as, as the former athlete, the former collegiate athlete, I played quarterback at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, obviously, I'm fortunate that my, a majority of my network revolves around um, athletics. So for when Aiden approached me with the opportunity to join forces here and you know, help acquire athletes at scale, I thought this would be a, a phenomenal opportunity for me to give back uh, to a demographic that I'm obviously so passionate about and once have taken part in myself and, and know uh, and have an expertise around uh, what it means to be an athlete. So We've been able to provide lots of value for the college athletes, and I'm excited about where we're, uh, where we're heading. Aiden, why did the opportunity for athletes to kind of control their own 
image and likeness and what that means for them financially. Uh, why has that made a difference in the athletic community? And what do you say to those who, you know, aren't supportive of the idea? The, there's no reason why athletes haven't been able to monetize their brand and leverage their platform when it's at its all-time peak in 99% of the cases, right? The majority of athletes aren't going to play professionally. So when they're competing at the collegiate level, that's when their brand is at its all-time peak. Um, to those people that say that they shouldn't be allowed to do so, I'd kind of just counter and say, then why should a nine-year-old TikToker be able to go and make millions of dollars? Or why should a musician who's a student at the Ohio State University be able to go and book a gig in Columbus, Ohio? Brandon, the athletes that you work with, what are some of the um, concerns that they might have? And then um, how are they, uh, after, that you, after you work with them, how do they feel about what's ahead for them? Yeah, Rhonda, the biggest thing in the entire space, and not just with the athletes, but with their families, with the universities, with the brands, is a lack of education and a lack of awareness around what's allowed and what's not allowed, what types of brands can or can't they work with, uh, what type of platforms are out there to offer them these types of resources to educate them. So that's what we try to do once the athlete is onboarded onto our platform, is try to uh, push forward educational materials uh, so they're aware of uh, of what our platform can offer them and, and why we're differentiated in, in the uh, name, image, and likeness space. Aiden, what's the growth opportunities you see for your business? Uh, it's incredible, quite frankly. Um, right now, obviously, we're really focusing on the collegiate athlete landscape, but as I'm sure you're aware, name, image, and likeness is um, in short order coming to the high school ranks as well. We've seen California high school athletes be able to monetize their name, image, and likeness. And it looks like New Jersey is on the horizon as well. And the technology that we've built is really something that can be used broadly beyond collegiate athletics for micro-influencers in general. Aiden, Brandon, it's been a pleasure getting to know you. Thank you and good luck. Thank you. Thanks so much for having us. When we think about the business of sports in New Jersey, we do know that people love to bet on their favorite teams. Our state made national headlines when monthly wagers on sports topped the $1 billion mark for the first time ever in September. Even though voters recently nixed the idea of expanding sports betting to include college games, New Jersey's sports betting industry is going to be just fine that's according to Yaniv Sherman, who's the head of U.S. operations at 888 Holdings, a leading online betting and gaming company. You know, it was interesting in New Jersey, the question on college sports betting was defeated in our most recent election. Is it a setback for the sports betting market in your view? Well, I think the sports betting market in New Jersey has been a pioneer in, um, in promoting sports betting and sports betting agenda. So generally speaking, uh, when you have less of a variety to offer the players, it's not a good thing. But generally speaking, I think this is something that the market will be able to, to absorb. I think we have a healthy selection of sports teams, professional sports teams and other events in New Jersey. So overall, uh, while it's not a pure positive, but I think that uh, the market can withstand something like this. We've seen so much growth in the New Jersey sports betting market, but at the same time, we know that other states are starting to offer sports betting uh, to join um, states that are already doing it. How much growth potentially do you see for the New Jersey market going forward? Will the law of averages catch up with it? It will reach maturity uh, at some point, but there are still a few growth drivers to this. As you know, I, I still think that there's a lot of recreational players that hasn't that haven't uh, discovered sports betting, and I think. Part of it is also the banking institution. Still, a fair portion of them does not approve gambling transactions. So there's still a few nascent growth pockets. But overall, I mean, I think the market's already over-indexing. So I think the pace, if anything, would probably subside somewhat in the near term. But at the same time, it's a market your company is interested in. Absolutely. I mean, we've, we've committed to this market eight years ago. Um, we've launched our gaming products in it, our poker and casino, both consumer facing with our partnership with uh, Caesars on uh, the World Series of Poker and then launched sport into it. It's, it's an important market for us because it's still one of a handful of markets that offers a full, a full product experience to the customers, to the players. 
Most of the other states in the US are sport only at this point. So it is an important market for us and it definitely um, has been a, you know, a, growth, a growth goal for us uh, locally. So I have to admit, I've been watching a lot of simply great NFL games the last couple of weeks. How important is football season now to sports betting? I mean, that's really one of the sports that attracts a lot of interest. Plainly speaking, everyone speaking, everyone, not just the operators, regulators, policymakers, uh, the customers themselves, the players themselves, the fans, are speaking in football cycles. So as you can see, typically legislation and then uh, launches are done in, in sort of tandem to uh, football season, both college and the NFL. Uh, that's sort of ex somewhat extended. So after the Super Bowl, everybody sort of has their sights on March Madness, but about, I would say, between 55 to 65% of bets are made on football. In some cases, 75 or 80% are made on football events. It's cyclic. So in football season, you sort of move between one week into another, Saturday is owned by colleges, Sunday by the NFL and two other games. So football is immensely important for this, uh, for this uh, market. Well, it's been really good uh, talking to you and getting your insight on what's happening in sports betting. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And that wraps up our show for this week. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Rhonda Schapler. We'll see you next week. Funding for NJ Business Beat provided by NJCU School of Business, a game-changing force offering programs like financial technology or business analytics and data science. We're steps away from the Exchange Place Path Train in Jersey City and minutes from Wall Street. Learn more at njcu.edu slash gamechanger.